I didn't bring my guitar with me, sorry. I'm going to take a moment, though, before we get started and actually thank uh, Christy Schmidt for putting together and her team for putting together a wonderful <laughs> evening today. Thank you. My wife and I have really enjoyed listening to all these different talks, these different perspectives, ways of seeing the, the world around us. I think we can appreciate diversity from a whole different perspective and are given sort of ways to act and ways to change. But I'm gonna hear, I'm gonna talk to you here about something beyond just the one species we've been talking about, humans. Because as it turns out, there are nine million other species that we share this planet with. And as a biologist, I think that we can learn a lot from this type of diversity, of understanding and appreciating the plants, the animals, even the bacteria that are around us, and what they can do, what they can teach us. Now, I'm gonna spend a little bit though, because I know lots of you don't actually care about frogs. I know this, I try. But I think we can learn a lot from these things, uh, even about our own diversity. The topics we've been discussing today, I think we can actually reach out and learn some things from the animal world around us. So I'll start, my students will be surprised by this, by a slide of a salamander. This is a uh, native to South Dakota salamander, the tiger salamander. And here I'm showing you four different races of salamander. Did you know that salamanders had races, yeah? Just in the way that humans have different skin color tones, right, that represent them and talk about their heritage, you can see here these incredibly different salamanders. No, you're not buying it, yeah? They all look the same to you, yeah? Well, maybe you can learn something from that in the sense that when a sweet, as a human, pick up one of these salamanders, they don't see our skin tones either. They just see a big, giant, scary human, right? Is racial diversity that simple? Obviously not. There's a lot of culture that goes. Humans are way more complicated than salamanders because they have culture, right? Things that link us to who we are. Well, animals also have culture. You might be surprised to know. So one of the things I work with, of course, are frogs, and we study their calls so we can identify what species are there, how many of them, these sorts of things. And we set out these digital call boxes to record their voices. <clears throat> and we can study something like uh, the leopard frog and listen to its call. It has a unique call. And we can uh, record these calls and put them in some software that will recognize the calls. And so it's kind of a cool technology. It makes our job easier. But as it turns out, we found out that we couldn't just grab any leopard frog. It had to be one specifically from South Dakota because the tone in their voice is slightly different. Frogs actually have dialects. Much in the same way we think of someone from the south that has a peculiar accent or the east coast. He's different. The same species of frog from different areas of North America sound differently. And that's because they have a genetic component to their call, which makes them sound the way they do. But they also learn from around them. They hear other males calling, and that affects the tone, the modularity, the rhythm, these sorts of things. And so when you look at the, see these frogs, they're actually surrounded by a culture of how they learn about the world around them by those around them. And what an incredible, interesting experience. And there's lots of different examples of culture that I won't go into, but I think you can see that animals are interesting maybe, yeah? <laughs> Other things though, you might think, well, humans still, nobody cares about this, Dr. Kirby. We care about humans only and that's it. Humans are so much more complicated because of things like sexuality, right? We've talked about this a little bit today. They have this diverse sexuality that animals just simply don't have. And sometimes they even heard things such as homosexuality as called unnatural. These are things that humans do, right? Well, as it turns out, another South Dakota native, buffalo, bison, have sexual interactions. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, okay? <laughs> Most of the sexual interactions you witness are homosexual in nature. So when you're at Wind Cave National Park with your kids, or your parents, even more awkwardly, <laughs> and a male jumps up and mounts something, and you think, oh, he's mounting that female. Chances are, actually, he's mounting another male, interestingly enough. And things like giraffes, even 90% of the interactions are homosexual in nature, same sexual nature, right? So there's instances that we find all throughout the animal world that match our own existence and understanding in humans. Okay, but that's just sexuality. What about gender? Like, that's something that's totally different, right? I mean, humans do this weird thing where males think they're females. Like, that's totally unnatural, right? No, it's not, okay? <laughs> we can see this. Again, this is a South Dakota native. I'm using South Dakota species here to show you how common this is. This is bluegill that you can go out and catch, right, go fishing. The male here is that larger one with the stripes. Females are smaller and blue in size. 
We have these sexual dimorphisms, you know, common in animals to help tell females from males. <clears throat> As it turns out, though, in this picture, there are two of what you think are females, but it turns out actually one of those is a male. One of those produces sperm and acts like a male, but looks like a female, right? These are things that we see that are common, again, in lots of different systems, not just this bluegill system, where males have a certain reproductive ability, but appear like females, helping us to understand and redefine what it means to be male or female. But what about changing your gender? Like, that's got to be something uniquely weird and human, this whole transgender thing, completely unnatural. Sorry, you're wrong again. I don't have a South Dakota example because this happens a lot in marine fishes. But here's our friend Nemo, right? We all know from the movie Finding Nemo, this is a clownfish. As it turns out, all clownfish start their lives as male. Every single one begins their life as a male. If they live long enough and successful enough and they're able to um, lord over the sea anemone, they turn into a female. Their entire reproductive system changes from sperm producing male to an egg-producing female, right? What an amazing feature. And it's also kind of funny, if you think back to the movie Finding Nemo, when the mom disappears, it's quite tragic for young children, okay? Be warned. But when the mom disappears, what does Marlin do? Well, in actuality, probably Marlin would have just turned into a female and says, I got to see an enemy myself, right? <laughs> so all kinds of stories and interesting patterns. These are just some things that I'm lifting, of course. There's lots of really interesting diversity that we find in the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and so on and so forth. And I think overall, as humans, we appreciate this. I think definitely we go out, we go on vacations, we take pictures of beautiful waterfalls, we go up to the mountains and see these incredible blue lakes, we post pictures on Facebook, nature is amazing, we love this diversity, these tropical areas with the beach, and we go out and maybe go on an eco tour and see some animals, and we appreciate diversity. But I think one thing you can think about throughout this day is this message is that appreciating diversity is not enough. You can't just appreciate the diversity. You have to do something about it. Because if you're not doing anything about it, then things are just going to continue in the same vein that they are. This is what we're happening now on the planet, a major biodiversity crisis. This is the sixth major extinction of life on Earth. What's unique about this extinction is it's entirely caused by us. There's not some meteor hitting the Earth causing these big damages. It's us. And what's frustrating about this is that we have the power, the ability, the technology, the resources to stop it quite easily. We say this over and over again. We have plans. We have ways of doing it. But we don't do anything about it. Isn't that a story we hear over and over again today in terms of talking about different diversity? We can understand it. We can begin to appreciate it. But we're not really acting to do anything. Right? Why is that? Well, I think, again, as I said before, we all have these innate biases. Maybe that's something you've learned today, right? You think, well, oh, maybe this is you know, a more liberal crowd because you came to the diversity-themed TED Talk. I'm open-minded to everything, but I challenge you. I bet you all hate snakes. <laughs> Why do you hate snakes? Today's St. Patrick's Day. One of the things that St. Patrick's was lauded for was driving all the snakes out of Ireland. Yes, and everybody's all in favor of that. To me, the herpetologist, that's worse than genocide. Genocide is killing a race of people. This is beyond a species. You're trying to kill many, many species of snakes. This is terrible. This is horrifying to me, right? But not to you. Think about that interest and difference. And where is this bias from? I mean, let me just pull the crowd real quick. How many of you have been bitten by a snake? Raise your hand. Notice I'm the only one raising my hand here, OK? Yeah? I still love snakes. What about this? How many of you, raise your hand, have been bitten by a dog? Oh, look, lots of people in this room have been bitten by dogs. Those vile, evil creatures. <laughs> you let them into our homes, even into your beds, you sick people. I can't go on a street, walking down the street, without encountering somebody with this evil, biting animal, right? That's what not what we think about dogs. That's our culture. We accept them, we love them, we have positive experiences with them, right? But if I were to walk down the street with a snake, well, that's exactly what you would think. So where do these come from? Where do these biases come from? How do we deal with them? And again, I think this is important for biodiversity, but it extends beyond any of these sort of questions that we're asking. How do we deal with these things? I think it starts with, in all these cases, 
of reaching out. So going into the unfamiliar, not just learning about it, but stepping out of your comfort zone and re-engaging with the unknown, the thing that you're afraid of even, right? Here in South Dakota, I'm showing a picture of one of our study sites. This is in the Prairie Pothole region. It's beautiful, right? But there are many beautiful places here in South Dakota. The Black Hills, many of you have been to. It's incredible. The Missouri River runs right down our state. There are really awesome opportunities to go out and experience nature right here, right now, right? And we need to do that. I think that's the big sort of step in this. How do we do that? Well, I think there's a lot of ways. I think some people are like, well, listen, Dr. Kirby, you're smart. You know all the animals. I just go out there and stare dumbly at these things. <laughs> How can I experience or have any knowledge? Well, this is the beauty of technology is that we're advancing so quickly and so fast that we actually are creating things that are incredible. One of these is an app called iNaturalist. So you can these little fancy devices that we carry around, right? You can actually get off of them and go outside and then get right back on them so you don't have to be too worried about it, okay? But there's an app called iNaturalist that you can download. It's phenomenal. It finds out where you are in the country. You take a picture of a plant, of an animal. It uses artificial intelligence, and it identifies that species for you, right? And so you can log where that species is, but also you can learn about that species. And of course, since you have your phone out, you can Google that particular species and learn all about them and learn these interesting facts. Right? So an easy way to bridge this gap in terms of just experiencing nature and learning from it. If you have kids, this is a great thing to do. It's free. If you're retired, this is a great thing to do. It's free. <laughs> if you're anywhere in between, it's the same. Right? This is a fun, free activity that anyone can do, and I think it's incredibly meaningful. I rarely find someone who says, I go out in nature and I'm really depressed about it. <laughs> right? I mean, you might hit the mosquitoes, but beyond that, okay, there's some incredible, powerful literature that shows that power of being outside and experiencing nature is incredible, okay? I'm gonna talk about one other app, though, being the one that studies uh, amphibians and reptiles. There's a specific app called Herp Mapper that's targeted toward these types of animals. So snakes included, but turtles, lizards, frogs, salamanders, all these sorts of things that you can go out and in the same way, find, snap a picture of, right? uploads to a database. Experts like myself get really excited because, you know, nobody does this, yeah? <laughs> Make me happy. We can look at it, we can identify those species and tell you what they are, give you feedback, okay? And you can see where they are. What's really important, though, is I'm maybe one of two herpetologists in the entire state of South Dakota. So quite literally, the state of South Dakota calls me and says, Jake, what's your opinion on this protecting the species? And I have to say, I don't know. I don't have that much data but this is an easy solution to getting that type of data, right? There's a species called the false map turtle that used to live all up and down the Missouri River in South Dakota. Now it's completely gone, as far as we can tell, from the northern Missouri. We don't know, we're trying to look for it. There's 800 miles of shoreline in Lake Oahe. It's a beast. But as I'm out there, there are literally hundreds of fishermen out there. How easy it is for them to grab out their phone and snap a picture of a turtle. And I can identify it as a soft shell turtle. Maybe it's not a false map turtle. It's great. These are the sort of power that we have in today's society and technology that it costs you almost nothing. And it's really easy to do. Allow us to reconnect with nature, to learn about these species, and also to become, I'm charging you with this idea of becoming a citizen scientist, right? So you can go out there and snap these pictures, get this information, and it's incredibly valuable to me. For instance, there's a species in our state, mud puppies, type of salamander, that hasn't been seen in our state in over 30 years. You could be the one to discover that again. Just going out and taking a picture of this slimy little salamandery thing, I'll be really excited about the different number of toes, but you'll have no idea, okay? But this is the incredible amount of information that we need, and this is not just in South Dakota, but across the entire country. There's ways that you can go out, even on your family vacations, if you're going out to the California deserts, Arizona deserts, into the forest. These apps are wide-ranging and, and available. And there are ways to engage, fun activities to do, and I think hopefully can reconnect you with this wider diversity, these nine million other species that are out there that we should be caring about. So please leave today downloading these apps and join me on this journey. <laughs> Thank you very much.